Hi, I'm Christopher. Um, thanks for listening. I'm going to be talking about assessing uh, trends in Chilean groundwater storage. But first, I'd like to thank Fulbright for the opportunity and the funding. Uh, it's been a, quite a long dream to be able to do something like this internationally. And um, now that it's being realized, uh, I'm really excited. Um, Uh, but before we kind of get into what my project really is going to be about, I um, kind of wanted to talk a little bit about my background, where I come from. Um, I am a Colorado native, and I grew up in the San Luis Valley, which is in southern Colorado. Um, it's probably one of the world's largest and highest alpine valleys. It has a base elevation of around 2,300 2, meters. Um, it's primarily an agricultural area where you have potatoes, lettuce, sugar beets, alfalfa, small grain oats grown throughout the valley. Um, and so I grew up in a small town of Lajara, and it's about 800 people. Um, we primarily grow uh, small grain oats and alfalfa. Uh, we've raised cattle in the area for four generations and used to uh, herd sheep across the Continental Divide. Um, we have a lot of fun in Colorado. We like the snowmobile. Uh, <laughs> Know, there's a lot of good hiking, um, you know, really neat scenic areas, even if you go slightly south into New Mexico near Taos, if you, if you like art and stuff. Um, but kind of one of the unique features that really defines the valley is the, uh, the great uh, Sand Dunes National Park, which is located uh, right here, kind of on the northeastern side of the valley. It's about a 77 square kilometer area of dunes. Um, you know, some dunes are as high as 200 meters. Uh, it's just a vast area of sand that, you know, if the wind blows from the southwest to the northeast, it kind of collects because you have the Sangre de Cristo mountain range here that, that really towers and prevents that sound from going over. So, a really cool home to grow up in. Um, so, a little bit about my education. I did my undergraduate at Regis University. I uh, majored in environmental science with minors in chemistry and mathematics. Um, it was really there, kind of got my love for research, and I did some research on cosmic ray muons and neutrinos, which are these subatomic particles that I did work in the Homestake mine in South Dakota, trying to measure flux of these subatomic particles about a mile below ground. Um, so after that, I went to the Colorado School of Mines and did a master's degree, really focused on carbon sequestration. Um, and it was shortly after that that I worked with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, started off with carbon sequestration programs, but with funding shifts, led to gas and vapor intrusion, which then led to um, me working on the potential impacts of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water resources. Uh, so we produced four reports, or four that I'm an author on, but there's five reports about different basins and you know what are these impacts of hydraulic fracturing on drinking water. But then I soon realized I needed a PhD to further advance um, in federal uh, government scientific research. So I returned to the Colorado School of Mines um, and did a PhD in environmental science and engineering. Graduated 10 months ago, and I've been doing a postdoc now for 10 months uh, before coming here. So, um, so a little bit about my kind of <coughs> research that I did that kind of ult ultimately led me to propose the research I did. Um, so my PhD research was really looking at the space-time geostatistics on groundwater data. So. Typically, in most places, Chile, uh, the United States, groundwater data, meaning depth to water, is pretty sparse. So how do you take a sparse data set and kind of leverage data in adjacent time periods or spatially to come up with the most probabilistic map that actually makes sense of this groundwater surface, where the resource exists, where it doesn't exist, maybe where we see depletion or increases in levels. Um, and then from that, you can translate these into volumetric depletions or um, increases in groundwater storage. And so uh, a lot of my PhD research really focused on honing in on developing a method for groundwater, coding this in R or MATLAB or even Python to get something that would actually produce uh, reasonable maps. Um, and then because of that, I started a postdoc 10 months ago uh, geared at using uh, satellite remote sensing, primarily Landsat, which Susan talked about, um, has a 16-day overpass on a given spot on Earth, but if you look at Landsat 5 and 7, which are both operational, you actually have an eight-day offset between the two satellites. Um, and so the really the big goal of this postdoc research was, can we take Landsat imagery, um, do a simplified surface energy balance, looking at long wave, short wave radiation, different light wavelengths, and ultimately calculate an actual evapotranspiration um, at a 30-meter resolution on you know a given spot, you know, a given basin. 
Um, and my primary application was wildfire response. So looking at how a forest stand um, evaporated transpired water pre-fire to post-fire. Um, and this is an example of the Chippewa Creek fire in Montana. This is what the ET response in millimeters looks like before the fire. This is after the fire, and then this is burn severity, where red is the highest burn area. So we see um, some pretty good response, and this actually was coded in Google Earth Engine, which has petabytes of data. I used over 1,500 images at over 1,000 terabytes of data. So it's a lot of stuff, but you can do these water balances to figure out what are the partitioning of water between uh, groundwater, surface water, biomass, or other types of things. But it's this kind of interest in the remote sensing, the water resources that got me to, to where I'm at. Um, so really the over the whole goal of this is can we contribute to a Chile's understanding of groundwater resources and really identify areas maybe that are depleting in groundwater resources or increasing. And really the objective, one of the main ones is can we use the GRACE satellites, which I'll briefly talk about those, um, across central and southern Chile to really get at these groundwater changes. Um, so the motivation behind this work stems from a lot of different areas. You know, it's the same here as in the United States, but we have a lot of different users of water from urban areas in Santiago. Uh, we have a lot of agriculture, a lot of vineyards that have different water demands. Um, but then we also have um, external influences that, that can impact the partitioning of this water, such as wildfires, um, which Chile has had before, and droughts. Uh, water can as you cut off that evapotranspiration response from wildfires, you might see an increased discharge in surface water streams. Um, so this partitioning behaves differently. Um, but then you also have the threat of climate change. We have um, increasing temperatures, increasing precipitation, which ultimately in that bottom or top left corner influences recharge rates to these groundwater resources. Um, so in many cases, we might be mining the groundwater and it's not replenishing back um, how it used to. Um, so just traditionally this is what's done and we will do this and couple this with satellites But when you think of groundwater wells, you can have wells that are in an unconfined aquifer or a confined aquifer These deeper wells, so they're under different uh, pressures and stresses um, And then this potentiometric surface is this theoretical surface that if this middle confining layer wasn't there that the height of the water would eventually reach So in many investigations we start with the groundwater well we might look at some time series of how this well is um, increasing or decreasing, and then we're going to take an entire well field and create some type of spatial map using freezing inverse distance weighting. Uh, but but this also is subject to uncertainty because you know we don't have a well here, but we're estimating what what is that level. And so the more dense your networks are, the better estimates you have. Uh, but then also because of these networks, are really restricted to smaller spatial scales. Um, so. What we'll be using is the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment satellites. There's two, GRACE and then this GRACE FO, which is follow-on, which most was recently launched. Um, but you basically have two satellites that are playing cat and, map, or cat and mouse as they orbit. Um, and as one satellite experiences a higher gravitational pull, it accelerates relative to the trailing satellite. And then once that trailing satellite hits that same gravitational pull, it might accelerate towards the leading satellite. And so you measure those distances between the two and GPS, and you basically map changes in gravity across uh, the globe or like a certain region. And so from these changes in gravity, you translate them with uh, mass concentration blocks or spherical harmonics, and you can basically get at a total depth of water that's fluctuating, that's likely causing the gravity to change. Because if we think of gravity changes on a month per month time scale, the most mobile form of mass is water. Um, so this, unlike groundwater wells, provides a big picture. We have you know, global coverage. Uh, it's at a monthly resolution, which is typically um, a lot better than you're going to get from a groundwater well, because most people sample once per year. Um, it does provide direct water volume estimates. When you use groundwater level data from a well, you have to look at aquifer specifics to actually get at that volumetric change. And it's just another tool in the toolbox. So you know, why not? It does have some limitations being coarse. Um, can't really observe the direction that the water is moving. Um, and you can't distinguish between different aquifers because it's a vertically integrated product. And so the methods of this would look something like this, where once that gravity signal is translated to a depth of water, we get um, some pixel uh, over a, a region. 
and really it's a vertically integrated response of other water in the area. So it could be you know, snow and ice, uh, it could be soil moisture, it could be surface water, so lakes, reservoirs, um, and then you also have this groundwater response. Um, in some places you might uh, want to include biomass because you're going to have water stored in the biomass. In other places it's not a really important signal. But then you can basically rearrange this total water storage as a TWS into something that just says, you know, what is this changing groundwater equal to? Well, it's equal to this total water storage that you're detecting from the uh, remote sensing gravity satellites minus snow and ice, minus soil moisture, minus biomass or surface water influences. And then ultimately your, your result is some groundwater response. And then that's where the ground truthing of existing groundwater networks come into play as you um, trying to compare the results of the remote sensing satellites. Um, so you really get some really good coverage, good temporal resolution. Uh, you do have, there is a slight gap between GRACE and GRACE follow-on, um, but really you have good coverage back to uh, March of 2002. So we can really see this temporal resolution of depletion or recharge. Um, so this is a collaboration with the Universidad de Concepcion Chian campus. I'll be working directly with Dr. Jose Luis Arumi, and he has a really, a, a really big passion for improving technology and better understanding Chilean uh, water resources. Um, so we'll be working really close with him and help him advise a PhD student and help with teach a couple classes. Uh, but then between the university, Jose Luis and myself, we really want a partnership out uh, with anybody who will listen like schools uh, at any level. Um, you know, he has really good partnerships with federal government um, and really try and get, uh, educate from the youth up about groundwater resources in Chile, but also how can we maybe uh, become resilient to climate change or how can we better adapt to the problems that we see happening um, across the country. Um, plans after Fulbright, uh, I do would like to return maybe to a federal job uh, NASA, the USGS, and EPA all have areas that my expertise would fall into. Uh, I haven't ruled out the possibility of academia after my 10 months postdoc. It, you know, it was really fun, uh, so I may return to that. Uh, but I do hope to continue this partnership with UDEC throughout my time, even beyond the Fulbright. Uh, I think there's a lot of really good collaboration and projects that can stem from this going forward. Uh, so with that, questions. Questions. Yeah, how, how, uh, thank you. Yeah. How closely does the landsat imagery correlate to groundwater resource by, you know, you mentioned the use of like surface imagery of long and short wave? Yeah. And the other one is the, you said the 200 square, 200,000 square kilometers was the surface area resolution for the great satellites. Mm -hmm. uh, the, what are the, the results are given in uh, total mass of is is it, Yeah, the results are given in a, in a depth of water. Yeah, so, so with your uh, first question, I think that was again. <laughs> yeah, the Landsat. The Landsat, yeah, so Landsat, you know, it's measuring uh, different wavelengths of light from red light, blue light, green light, uh, near infrared, short wave. But really, in terms of groundwater, your best bet on using that to get at groundwater is calculating this ET product, uh, which we have already developed. But then you do a simple water balance. You say, what are my inputs and outputs on a system? So a simple balance would be we have a certain amount of precipitation across an area or a basin. If we subtract out that evapotranspiration response, we're left with a residual. And depending if you've done the right math or subtracted the right amount of things or inputs, that residual is a groundwater term that, or recharge that's actually making it to the aquifer. So from Landsat, you can get at that. Now with the GRACE satellites, you know, this 200,000 square kilometer area, it's pretty, those are pretty large areas. But what that really means is that when you do these studies, you need to look across larger areas. The resolution of the satellite is really, you get a one degree grid, which is roughly you know, 80 by 100 kilometers. So it's a, a pixelated grid. But the reason you go out to 200 square kilometers are because you have measurement and leakage error um, just in the processing of the data, but also you might have a point mass that's causing a gravitational influence that the satellite is picking up from over here, but it really doesn't have an impact over here. So as you spread out these larger uh, areas, you minimize these external influences that are actually causing the observed gravity change that uh, really aren't, don't mean anything for that area. Is that 
public? Uh, it is public data, yeah. yeah. Processing it is another kind of a beast, <laughs> just because you have to know it, but the data, all this data is public, which is great because you know, when I leave Chile, uh, folks at the university will be able to actually access this and keep applying it to their own problems. Yeah. I'm curious about the political part of the water, and specifically, like in Chile, the way that miners have, or mining companies have kind of come into communities mm -hmm. with the permission of the communities, but also like taking like a lot of water from sole source aquifers. Yeah. And like, do you plan on sharing this information with communities in ways that communities can be proactive and yeah, absolutely. Their water? Yeah, we hope to share this. You know, because we'd be mostly working in the central and southern regions, so like with agricultural producers, I think we could really give them a better idea of where their water comes from. Comes from Are they contributing to depletion or not? Um, in terms of like the mining, um, from my understanding, more mining occurs in the northern parts of Chile with like lithium mining. And even some of the headlines that I showed, you know, there's like these water, there's always something about water in the media uh, with lithium or droughts. Um, and so I think there are applications to share that with them. Um, and we do hope to make this publicly available to anybody who will listen. Um, and I think the ramifications, you know, hopefully promote change or conservation, um, or at least start the, the conversation of, you know, where does your water come from and what does the future look like? And how do, to, to piggyback on that, uh, how do you see the privatization of the water playing into that? Like, if the people don't own the water, it's owned sort of by these companies. Right, yeah, that, that becomes a little bit more challenging because, you know, if it's owned by these companies, you know, who has the right to use it or tell them how to use it becomes um, challenging. And I think, you know, providing the information out there and let local uh, politicians, local uh, government or even federal government kind of step in and figure out how this works. Um, in Colorado, you know, there's this water rights uh, debate that always goes on of prior appropriation is the water tributary, so is it hydraulically connected to surface waters, is it not? How much can you pump? Because it's, it's, it's a public right, but it's treated as a private in Colorado. So I think there are some translations there. Um, but in terms of the ultimate response, that's probably going to determine on, be determined on what we find. Are there certain areas that are problematic? And, but Jose Luis, who I'll be working with, he's very well connected with the community and the government. So he knows the right people to talk to. and you know, not step on toes. Yeah. So, did you choose to come to Chile for this project because of the mega drought and the, or I don't know, why did you choose to Yeah, you know, mega project? drought, but also the, the wildfires that Chile was experiencing. Yeah. Um, and I had came down to Chile two years ago for an invited talk at the same university. Um, they had went to a national conference in the US. They expressed interest in applications in Chile. Um, teaching them how to process the data and utilize it. And so that kind of got my wheels spinning. Because, OK, this, this could work. Um, so once I applied a year and a half ago, I knew graduation was in sight, and that just the timing of everything would be perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Chris. Yeah.